In the early 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution was developing in England and Europe, in New England we were living in communities of single-family farms. A typical family lived in a small house located on their own farmland, not in town. Each farmhouse was within sight of those of a number of other families because the farmhouses were separated by the lanes of the farmland. You could see the candlelight of your neighbor's home from your own front door. Nylander explains that as you approached your neighbor's doorway, you would likely hear the whir of the spinning wheel and the thump of the butter churn. Dwellings were more scattered in the less populated south. And along the western frontier, a family might go weeks without seeing another person because they were widely scattered. Most homes obtain light by burning one candle. A well-off home is distinguished simply by lighting six candles instead of one. By having a complete set of dishes, having glass windows, and maybe even having a piano fort but the same set of daily chores are done in both homes. Nylander explains that in the evening, the family and guests gather around the snug fireside to sing, play music, sew, knit, make buttons, whittle clothespins and such, repair harnesses or furnishings, and to listen while one person reads aloud from a book of fiction, poetry, dramatic plays, philosophy, theology, or even chemistry. In New England, it takes the combined efforts of many persons working all day long just to maintain the household. The well-working home was said to be a well-regulated home. A lone person cannot do all that is needed. When one woman becomes ill, the other women of the house must fill in for her by working extra hours and there is extra help from women of the neighboring homes. The same thing occurs when a man is ill. To repay for the knitting help done by a neighboring woman today, a man might go to her house tomorrow to chop wood. He will be fed while he is working there until evening. A woman might sew a shirt for a man who is helping thresh wheat at her house. In the colonial period, Half the homes have a spinning wheel, but only one in ten homes has a weaving loom and raises sheep or grows flax. Very few homes cover all bases by raising and shearing sheep, spinning wool, carding, dyeing, weaving cloth, and sewing clothes. Few mothers can boast that her children are now warmly clad in the fleece that her sheep wore last winter. These steps are instead spread around town. With the increase of imported and low-cost factory-made cloth, all so-called homespun clothing becomes ridiculed by the fashion conscious. As it becomes cheaper to buy cloth and clothing than to make it at home, some frightened conservatives warn that the resulting idleness would lead to immorality in girls. Affordable wallpaper begins to arrive from France, England, and China. As dishware and pots become more affordable, each person at the dinner table has their own plate, and we begin to have bathing basins large enough to stand in. These could be used in a private room in the summer, but had to be used near the fireplace in the winter. It is becoming more common to have a separate bedroom, even two. Home doors don't have locks, but a storage box that holds valuables might have one. One person who stole a hat was known as Hat Tom for the rest of his life. Nylander explains that relatives and neighbors enter households freely in an act of coming and going to share joys and sorrows and to offer assistance, advice, and support. The same girls who work together as adolescents spinning thread and husking corn will soon fit each other's wedding gown, run their own hospitable kitchens, encourage each other during labor, and have established places in the community. 
The community has its sages, high spirits, willing helpers, and busybodies. The household feeds any friend or relative who happens to be in the area at mealtime and will put them up for the night when overtaken by darkness or weather. Refreshments are given to any neighbor or stranger who walks by or asks for information or is chasing an errant animal or looking for berries to gather. Food and a bed is given to traveling peddlers and those who repair shoes, baskets, or tinware and such. They might sleep in the barn, by the fireplace, or even in bed with everyone else. In one week, a house might receive visits from brothers, aunts, cousins, cousins of cousins, and friends. Most would be fed and some would spend the night. A visiting woman might share the bed with the wife and husband of the house. Visitors often bring their sewing and such so that they can work while chatting and sharing news. A shopkeeper's home is especially busy. In one month, the household might make 100 extra meals and have 70 overnight guests who have come to conduct business and will join in whatever work is being done. Less visiting occurs during the busy spring and fall portions of the agricultural cycle. More visiting occurs when snow cover makes for easy travel by sleigh. Sleighs enable one to visit a home even 10 miles away and return the same evening. A full moon provides light into the evening, which is something that today's big city dwellers do not notice because of the bright street lights. Several sleighs full of people might travel together to drink at a tavern. Hawk explains that the farmhouse was not an isolated entity, but a focal point of the neighborhood, which extends outward in a radius of about one day's travel. The extended family members and their wards living in this area cooperate as a unit. A call for help from a faraway relative is answered. This unit performed all the functions that the medieval European village had done, including the care of sick, indigent, orphan, decrepit, and senile. Our life begins within our own warm and crowded home, with the community's women assisting and guiding as has been done since our species began. Men wait outdoors. More often, mom gave birth while standing than while lying down. In the frontier west, dad is often the only person around so mom will sit in his lap for support while giving birth. If the baby isn't emerging, the neighborhood women try to turn it and sometimes have to decide within a few moments that to at least save the mother, they might have to pull the baby out in pieces. In their book, Life in a Medieval Village, Francis and Joseph Guise said that whenever a woman died during childbirth, the midwife was expected to quickly cut her open to remove the baby in hopes of at least saving its life. It is guaranteed that within the last few centuries, one of your grandmothers lost a child or her own life in this way. In New England, when a woman has her first delivery, her mother or her sister might stay in her home for six weeks to run the house, give parenting advice, and allow the new mother to devote more time to the newborn. One in six of us die before reaching the age of one. This happens less often among gather-hunter peoples than among farmers. Only in recent decades have we learned that simple sanitation, clean water, and basic health care is all that is needed to avoid having our babies die before reaching the age of one. In New England, most couples had seven or eight childbirths, so most parents knew what it was like to lose an infant. When an infant died, it was in its mother's arms. Larkin explains that what is now seen as a disastrous stroke of fate was the expected experience of most families back then. Some women would not choose a name or make clothing until the child had evidently survived. Some said that they tried not to love too dearly until some weeks had passed. Many of our infants die of the intestinal infections that commonly occur at the end of a hot summer. 
Nursing typically lasts 12 to 15 months until after the child's second summer has ended because it has been noticed that nursing decreases the number of infections occurring at the end of a hot summer season. Of course, there was much daily discussion in the neighborhood about whose baby was sick, whose was not, and what each mother and father were doing differently. Back in our biological past, such discussions began the very moment that we had sufficient language to do so. During our childhood, many of us lose a parent and a brother or sister and a young adult within the extended family. Even worse was the fact that if a disease kills one person in our home, then it will likely kill a couple of others too, or even all five of the children. Overall, one in four or five of us die before each, reaching the age of 21. Only half of us slaves live to be an adult. Larkin explains that disease and bodily discomfort could rarely be cured, only endured. The accidents that each of us accumulated through life were easily visible from the way we limped or moved. Typically, one in ten of the persons at any gathering would show the effects of the poorly repaired broken bones of their past. It was so common to see somebody have a three-minute bout of malarial shaking that the event was treated in a matter-of-fact manner. Doctors did not assist in births until after the 1840 arrival of the tools for troublesome births. For several years after that, the doctor would have been surrounded by many critics while attending childbirths. It took a few more decades for the house-calling doctor to spread from the wealthiest urban areas to rural areas. Childbirth slowly changed from the anciently communal female event to the private relation between a woman and her doctor. The daguerreotype arrived in New England in the 1840s. One woman said that a picture allowed her to gaze once more into the almost speaking face of her deceased child. A child is placed in a holder especially to be kept away from the fireplace and boiling water. A hobby horse is more fun. The infant might sleep next to the parents in a trommel bed that slides under their own bed to save space during the day. The toddler might use a night toilet. Here are the toys of one child. Next, Reenactors from the University of North Carolina and Colonial America demonstrate some common children's toys and games. Around age 16, George Washington recorded 100 rules of manner as an exercise of a schoolboy. Here is a girl's room. And a doll. This windproof lantern, which is made in the local tin shop, has holes that lend some light out and little wind in during the midnight dash. Here's a home from the year 1819. The item hanging on the right is a candle holder whose length can be adjusted to brighten where needed. Here are pans, an ash scoop, and a bed warmer. 
In this wealthier home, the tall back chair almost wraps around you to help keep you warm in the winter. The average family size was five or six persons, which is double today's average. In the year 1800, 20% of rural homes were occupied by two families, but this number had decreased to just 10% by 1850. Until 1850, 20% of our families had eight or more persons. Today, half as many homes have this number. This means that in the early 1800s, children were seen everywhere, much more so than occurs today. In the 1800s, it was common for a home to include extra, unrelated persons, including co-workers, kinfolk, or lodgers. The diaries of the Ward family in Massachusetts show that throughout a 30-year period, they kept 11 to 16 guests in their home. They were wealthy enough to afford to do this. Prosperous families could house more kin, employ more workers, and have longer-staying guests. A more prosperous family might have a live-in helper who was a girl or a boy from a poorer family working to establish their own future farm. A girl was paid one quarter as much as a boy. These youths would work for one or two years at one farm before switching to work for another. Children from homes with more children than means could be bitted out until adulthood to help with a more prosperous family's chores. A poor family with little land might send their eight-year-old to work and stay at a nearby farm, trading the child's labor for food and shelter. As they become mid-teenagers, they would frequently return home to help in their parents' own home.